Now, I request Professor Silesh Nair, Chairman Baroda Center, IIA Gujarat Chapter, and Principal College of Architecture, SVID Vasad, to address the gathering. All the professionals, academicians, and students present in this virtual platform, and our today's speaker, Architect Surendra Baga. Very good evening, one and all. World Architecture Day is celebrated on the first Monday of October in parallel with UN World Habitat Day, for which the theme of this year is Housing for All, a Better Urban Future. Urban policies must ensure adequate services, shelter and recreational space for all citizens. Urban planning, design and architecture are critical to a better future for all. By choosing a different theme each year, this World Architecture Day seeks to draw attention to all stakeholders, students, academicians, professionals, as well as the public to the problem concerning to cities and habitat. We all have congregated today to celebrate the World Architecture Day as an architect's commitment to our societies, our ecosystems, and our cities. To mark this occasion, Indian Institute of Architects Baroda Center have teamed up with College of Architecture SVIT Vasat and APID Vidyanagar to pick up a series of talks that capture the major trials and trends that are shaping the building environment around us. Also, this discourse which reminds shared responsibility for the future of the human habitat. In this condition, where social media has become the modern agora of societies, we are re-evaluating the basis of our society, economies, and built environment to become more relevant and more desirable than ever. Just as it is informed, just as it is reforming social customs and spaces all across the world, the global pandemic is revealing once again how crises affect the poorest and most vulnerable population disproportionately. Today, as the world paves for a few new future, our platform for interaction has also informed from physical to the digital. We seek for a level of association where architects, academicians, and students would arrive on a correlative platform. IAA Baroda Center has been organizing many events joining hands with Academic Institute of Vadodara, which would encourage higher level of participation and involvement by professionals, academicians, and students, which will promote cross-level dialogues. Professional world has always been on a different ride. Being a student, you always explore and the impossible to which academicians foster their interest and then it adds their zeal as they enter into the professional field. Our aim is to blend this both. Today, as we rejoice this day, we take step to get closer in aiming a better place for humanity. Small actions can collectively make a big difference and create a significant change. As on this very special day, Indian Institute of Architects Baroda Center, along with SVAT and APID, welcome you all to this webinar. There are always ups and downs for a new start, but as Plato said, the beginning is the most important part of work. Everything will then follow. Now, I shall open this platform to our speaker and enlighten the students with their insights. It's great honor for us to present you one of the great architects working with urban cityscape and urban planning, architect Surendra Bhaga. Welcome you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your inspiring words. Now I request Professor Mahida, Pallavi Mahida to give a brief introduction of Surinder, sir. Thank you, Prerna. Myself, Professor Pallavi Mahida, feel privileged to in introduce a renowned personality, architect Surinder Bhaga. Architect Sundar Bhaga has established architectural organization Sakar Foundation in Chandigarh in 1984. His works are published in many journals and newspapers of repute. Two of his churches were exhibited in the 5th Asian Congress of Architects held at Lahore in Pakistan. Mr. Bhaga was given Sri Sir Vishweshwaraya Award in 1995 by Hadko for energy efficient housing design. His Baptist Church at Chandigarh is selected by Ministry of Non-Conventional Energy Sources and Terry as one of the best 41 energy efficient buildings in India. 
Police Memorial Jammu, designed by Mr. Baga, got Outstanding Concrete Structure Award from Indian Concrete Institute. He has co-authored three books, namely Modern Architecture in India, Post-Independence Perspective, New Indian Homes, and Lee Kabuzier and Peri Generate, Footprints on the Sands of Indian Architecture. He worked as Chairman of IIA, Chandigarh Punjab Chapter, for two terms, 200, 2008 and 2012. He has worked as chairman of IIA Publication Board and editor of Journal of Indian Institute of Architects from 2013 to 2015. He was chairman of Chandigarh Municipal Corporation Commu uh, Committee for Buildings and Roads. Currently, he is member of Advisory Committee of India's Home, Minister, uh, Home Minist Ministry on Union Territories. I once again welcome you, sir, on this virtual platform and request you to begin the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mahida, ma'am. Now I hand over the platform to Surinder, sir. Sir, your audio is muted, I guess. Hello. Can you listen to me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. First of all, I am grateful to SVIT and APIED for uh, giving me this opportunity to be with you. I am equally grateful to IA Broda Center for uh, facilitating my talk there. And uh, in person, I am uh, especially grateful to Professor uh, Salish Nayar. Palbi, ma'am, Professor Taha, and Prerna ji for uh, you know looking after this whole program for my sake. It's a, it's a golden opportunity for me to share my thoughts with uh, your esteemed faculty and students. I I got a chance to do a book on the works of Kabuzier and Piri Janre, which was funded by the Swiss government. And during uh, that study, I studied the contemporary capital cities. So I would like to share my inputs on uh, contemporary capital cities. You know, in the middle of uh, 1950s, Chandigarh came into existence. And it was followed by Islamabad, which is the capital city of Pakistan, which came into existence in the year 1960. Then Brasilia, 1960, and Canberra also, you know, came little after uh, Chandigarh, that is the capital of Australia. So, in brief, we will be touching all these cities. First of all, I will start with my own city, Chandigarh. Now, this is the master plan of uh, Chandigarh, you can see, and it has about 16 kilometers, uh, this brown belt around, which is a, uh, which is called a periphery of Chandigarh, 16 kilometer belt. Kabuzia said no construction is permissible in this area, because uh, in order to make the city survive, we need to have uh, farmlands, poultry farms around the capital, around the Chandigarh city but it never happened that way many encroachments are done by the government itself and uh, chandigarh's name has been uh, derived from uh, the hindu goddess uh, chandi we have a very famous temple on the outer skirts of uh, city chandigarh is catering to the population of nearly 1.2 million now and it is located at the foothill of Shima, uh, himalayas Shivalik foothill of uh, foothills. You know, the site which was allocated for Chandigarh, you know, have many mango groves and uh, it was covering about 24 villages. And on the sites there, it is bound by two seasonal rivulets. Pandit Nehru was the visionary behind uh, establishing this uh, great city. And uh, the brief given to the planners was very different from any conventional thought. He's, he told the architects that I want a city which is modern and which is unfettered by the traditions of the past. 
you know please know this is something very unique which he guided and and uh, nehru's friend a american planner albert mayer came to india along with his architect uh, colleague uh, his name was matthew nowitzki they both uh, planned uh, chandigarh city and this plan which is on the screen is uh, is uh, prepared by albert mayer and uh, matthew nowitzki for a population of uh, half a million and uh, the road pattern was derived from the contours of the site and uh, you know the two natural uh, uh, valleys which are coming uh, you know in the site they are developed into green parks and this was the main salient features phasing of the plan was also done but uh, this uh, matthew novelski the uh, the architect when he was coming from america uh, um, with all the documents and drawings the plane crashed and uh, you know albert mayer got very scary and he said that alone i will not be able to take up such a huge project so albert mayer was reluctant to take the project so uh, this uh, pandit nehru asked uh, his team to look for another architect that was the historic background so the the plan which uh, uh, albert mayer's team gave got uh, one super block you know nowadays we call it sector but in the terminology of uh, mayor he used to call it super block super block was a uh, was having dimensions of 500 meters by 1000 meters and it was further subdivided into three sections one is for uh, uh, lower lower income group other segment is dedicated to middle income and then the next segment is uh, high income groups so the the aim was to intermix different income groups and uh, but somehow when he could not take up the project then uh, kabuzie arrived at the indian scene you can see in this picture kabuzie and pandit nehru are walking and uh, this is a plan given by uh, kabuzie you can see um, you know he compared the uh, chandigarh plan with a human body and he said head is the capital complex where we have shown in red color and uh, then heart is the commercial uh, center in the uh, in the in the middle of the city and uh, these uh, green park strips and the gardens are called lungs and the road network and the pedestrian pathways are termed as circulatory system and limbs are uh, the educational uh, belt and the industrial belt which is located located on either side of the city this is how kabuzi described his uh, city this is how he compared it with the human body and uh, <clears throat> kabuzi's plan was basically you know uh, catering to the four basic functions of human need one was living working circulation and care of body and spirit and uh, many people may not be knowing that uh, kabuzie finalized chandigarh's master plan in just 4 days you know you look at the time taken he finalized the entire chandigarh plan in just 4 days because he was loaded with lot of studies with lot lot of theories already he was fully prepared that in case he gets uh, some uh, such assignment what he is going to do uh, and he stated the the road network which is given by uh, this uh, mayor team and uh, you know in his uh, thoughts he has written in some some books that a curved street is a donkey street he wrote he said for a vehicular movement you need straight roads this is the logic he has given and uh, this sketch is indicating that uh, how he uh, described his uh, circulation system in the city you know he named the roads like v1 v2 up till v7 and v8 you know according to the volume of traffic they carry the roads are named accordingly now just some glimpses of the road network these are some one major roads the intersection of major roads having a huge roundabout this is the view at night 
this road is called Janmark, which is leading to the capital complex. You can see in the foreground, uh, in the background, you can see the, uh, the mountains and you can also see, you know, the capital complex. And Janmark, it is named Janmark because most of the people which are going to the capital complex are following this route. This is the view of the Janmark during the day. On the right side, we have seven storied uh, frame structure buildings. And on the left side, we have, you know, garden strip. And the roads are, all the roads are designed in such a manner that they are focusing on the hills. And each road had, uh, you know, different kind of a plantation so that at different times, all roads will look different. You know, the plantation of the roads has been done very, very carefully by a expert team under the guidance of Kabuzier. You know, when, when the main road was not to be disturbed, a side road was laid to, to feed to the major institutions. You know, when you have to enter some educational campus, you have to take the inner road uh, by diverting from the main road. Then uh, coming to the sector plan. The Kabuzir sector plan was 800 meters by 1200 meters and it's a neighborhood unit catering to a population of nearly 3000 to 20,000. And uh, it is a self-sufficient entry from uh, four sides and the market is located in the middle and uh, along with the market each sector will have a dispensary, each sector will have a uh, schools, primary school, high school and facilities like this. So that, you know, the residents of that particular sector may not have to go outside for buying uh, their daily needs. And the uh, landscaping and the, uh, you know, the green uh, areas are designed in a proper hierarchy. You know, he has given city level green spaces then he has uh, given uh, free flowing uh, green spaces which are passing from one sector to the other sector then semi private green spaces then private green areas in the residential units a proper hierarchy of green spaces is followed and uh, coming to traffic and parking chandigarh is the only city probably in, in india where the the number of vehicles are almost uh, equal to the number of inhabitants. We have nearly 13 lakhs population and we have 13 lakh uh, vehicles. And a registration of nearly 4,000 new vehicles is done every month. As a result, the city remains very congested in spite of having huge roads and many, many uh, vehicles cross the city daily. You can see the traffic here in spite of having such a beautiful planning look at the traffic scene because we have too many number of vehicles okay then uh, you know when uh, sector 17 which is the city center it was being planned Kabuzia thought that he will have two uh, over bridges in the which will be passing through uh, sector 17 and the lower level will be totally pedestrianized so that shoppers and shopkeepers can move freely in the plaza area. But due to some reasons, one overbridge was built, you know, 70 years back. But one bridge was pending because of some technical hitches. And I was uh, made counselor in Chandigarh Municipal Corporation. I thought uh, being an architect, I should do something uh, different. So I took up that project of uh, constructing the pending overbridge which was designed by Carbuzier and I succeeded in that and this overbridge was built uh, with my initiative just uh, three four years back and uh, you know with with the construction and completion of this overbridge the entire sector 17 has been pedestrianized you can see the pictures of this uh, overbridge You can see the bottom part of the plaza is uh, the floor of the plaza is totally pedestrianized with the construction of this and the vehicles, uh, uh, you know, they cross over this uh, overbridge. Some other pictures of the same. You know, when designing these roundabouts, 
Kabuzi gave a very unique plan. He said that in the phase one, we will have roundabouts when we have less number of uh, vehicles. And in the phase two, we will add slip roads, which is uh, the bottom picture, bottom sketch. And in the third, uh, third uh, phase, he said we will add underbridge. And in the fourth phase, we will have underbridge and overbridge also. So this is, uh, he said at the same roundabout, we can segregate traffic at uh, three levels and there will not be any congestion. But unfortunately, it was not built that way. Only two phases are um, you know, introduced and uh, the third and the fourth phase is not built so far. So, which, which has led to a lot of uh, congestion on the roads. And uh, after that, uh, in sector 17, we have a lot of uh, uh, parking problems. The government uh, has proposed four underground uh, parking lots because uh, if we built it up, up uh, uh, above the ground, that will, uh, that will uh, spoil the character of the city. So as a councillor, I was given the responsibility by the governor that, okay, you see if at least one of the under parking can be built. So I, I studied that and I took up some uh, initiatives and uh, one multi-level underground parking was built, costing about 40 crores and it can accommodate nearly 1000 cars. And this is the one which we could build during my tenure as a councillor of Chandigarh Municipal Corporation. And uh, now it can accommodate uh, nearly 1,000 cars, but uh, without spoiling the character of the city. These are the pictures of the same multi-level parking in sector 17. It is recently constructed. Sector 17 is a commercial district of uh, Chandigarh, which is uh, called heart of the city by Kabuzier in, in his language. Okay, now I will be talking briefly about the capital complex, which is rated as one of the best capital complex around the world in the 20th century ever built. It is spread over uh, nearly 100 acres of land and it consists of uh, components like assembly hall, high, co high court, secretariat, and uh, Governor's Palace, which is now a museum of knowledge, and some monuments. <laughs> then, this is the road leading to the capital complex. You can see capital complex is visible on the left side on the extreme, and on the foothills you can see the uh, assembly, and on the left side is the uh, uh, secretariat. This is the master plan, you can see, uh, the left side we have a, a, a linear building which is called a secretariat then a assembly hall then a, just opposite to that we have a, a high court and on top we have a provision for a, this a museum of knowledge and then uh, you know we have a, at number seven we have a, a open hand monument and so on this is the view of the capital complex you can see this uh, beautiful building of uh, assembly hall. You know, assembly hall has, uh, you know, a combination of horizontal and vertical louvers woven all around. And th in the middle, we have a, uh, 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 um, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, assembly chamber. And it is lit with the skylight and all that. And you can see at the far end, you can see the, uh, this um, uh, high court and how it is uh, set, uh, you know, uh, planned beautifully amid a lot of greenery, water bodies, and at the foothill of the Shivaliks mountains. And Chandigarh, you know, few years back, Chandigarh celebrated 50 years of its existence. And uh, this photo was taken at night when all the buildings of Chandigarh were lit. And uh, these are some of uh, other uh, glimpses of Chandigarh uh, capital complex. This picture is taken from the balcony of a uh, secretariat complex. Another one. And uh, this is the plan of the famous assembly hall. The red areas are indicating on the periphery uh, the, the offices and uh, the circle in the middle is assembly chamber and the yellow areas are the circulation areas. 
uh, you know, where the uh, MLAs can move around, bureaucrats can discuss and all that. This is a cross section. This is a cross section and uh, you can see uh, a structure like uh, thermal th thermal uh, station uh, is uh, is uh, um, has influenced the design of uh, this particular assembly hall and you will be surprised that uh, Kabuzier was traveling from uh, Ahmedabad to Chandigarh by air and he saw this particular a thermal station of Ahmedabad and he got inspired from that and uh, you know he he said that I want something like this uh, to be topping my assembly hall building and after reaching here he made these sketches you can see these sketches uh, taking inspiration from a thermal station of Ahmedabad and ultimately this building came into existence and you see this is another view of the uh, assembly hall uh, it is there is a huge uh, uh, gutter kind of a roof on the on the front side you know this gutter takes the water of entire but um, the entire terrace and that that water comes down to the water body through this uh, you know gutter it's a beautiful structure I think the kind of a shattering, the kind of a precision with which it is executed, it is par excellence. It cannot be done even in Europe now. I don't know how they built it. Then, uh, you know, a shallow water pool in the middle of this to, you know, uh, create a nice ambience and uh, cool the dusty winds. And the governor enters from this side when he comes to the assembly hall. Some, you know, on the above, on the top picture, you know, he has hidden some post office and some accommodation for the security guards and some garages and all that. And he designed these special openings to hide those uh, low, low height structures and he termed it as potato openings in his writings. This is the rooftop of uh, assembly hall. You can see from this uh, stair, uh, uh, tower, a bridge goes on the top of this uh, skylight and uh, you know with this skylight can be cleaned and maintained. This is another view of the same. This is uh, a picture of Kabuzier looking at the, the full size model of uh, assembly hall. And this uh, six gentleman is one of the most favorite, uh, most favorite modeler of uh, Carbusier and uh, his models are displayed all over the Europe. He's a very well-known modeler. He's no more. Uh, Carbusier used to make all his models, even for his foreign buildings from Chandigarh, by this sick gentleman. And assembly hall, you know, has a special door for the governor, and this is the design of this door. You will be surprised that there is a dedicated book written by some foreign author. Uh, on this door itself. This door was painted by Kabuzier himself and it was uh, having a huge cost. It was fabricated in France and it was brought to uh, India by ship and uh, the, the entire cost was borne by the French government. This is the interior of the assembly hall you can see this uh, very uh, colorful interior with the you know these abstract forms are the uh, acoustical panels you can see on the um, uh, uh, roof of this uh, assembly hall these uh, these acoustical panels are abstract shaped to create interest in the interiors then this is the ceremonial space around the assembly chamber where you know uh, the um, the movement happens the discussions happens for the all the bureaucrats and all the um, this uh, lawmakers, the the pedestrian movement and the vehicular movement is totally segregate, segregated in the assembly in the capital complex. You know, you you can see at the bottom level we have a, a vehicular movement and pedestrians can move over these bridges when they go from one building to the another one. You can see 
uh, how the uh, pedestrian and the vehicular movement is segregated. This is the view at night of the assembly hall. Then is the high court. High court is uh, uh, one of the first building to be executed in uh, capital complex. You, you, you can see it, it uh, follows the right orientation and the front facade is, uh, you know, the glazing is covered by the combination of horizontal and vertical louvers and the building has a double roof because it, only then it can meet with the harsh climatic conditions of Chandigarh. This is a front view from where the only judges are allowed to enter. This is the judges entry from the front side. And uh, this is a view from the plaza side. And uh, these are the sketches and the plans and the sections of uh, this uh, famous building of High Court. And uh, Abuzier himself looking at the model of High Court. This is the rear side of High Court from where public and advocates can enter the High Court. The movement of uh, judges, public and advocates is totally segregated in order to maintain a proper discipline and hierarchy. This is the dedicated judge's entry. This is, uh, you know, the, this is how he shielded his windows. In order to tackle acoustics in the interiors, he hired, you know, these uh, uh, artisans from Kashmir to weave these, uh, you know, tapestries, and this uh, huge tapestry in the Chief Justice Court is designed by Kabuzier, and it is uh, executed in. Uh, it is made in Jammu Kashmir, and then it's uh, hanged on the wall, and this serves as a acoustical material for the interior of the Chief Justice. You know, when the High Court was built. The, the administration uh, uh, recognizes that uh, this accommodation is far less than uh, um, far less than the requirement so they, they approached Kabuzier. he said no problem we will add uh, we will add extension plan and on the rear side he gave a sketch that this is how you can expand this uh, high court on the rear side this annexi plan was given by Kabuzier, and the plan was made in such a manner so that it will not clash with the uh, the architecture and the style of the main high court building. It, it remains very subdued building on the back side. And uh, you know, there was some uh, rain come entering the building. So uh, again, Kabuzier was approached. He gave this temporary, he said we will make some sort of a, a veranda with a steel structure or something. So this was also designed by him. Then is the Secretariat complex. It's a very long building, about 800 feet uh, long and 10 story high and you can see in the facade uh, it is oriented in such a manner uh, that it's not uh, coming in the way of the view of the Shivalik Hills and it, it follows the right orientation to suit Chandigarh and uh, the you can see the glazing is not visible glazing is properly shielded uh, from the rain and the sun and it's about 12 feet deep inside you can see the building and on the top of the building we have a terrace garden which which was one of the favorite uh, element of uh, Kabuzia's architecture this is the picture of uh, secretariat taken from the assembly hall you can see the plan it's a doubly loaded corridor having offices on either side and the ramps are protruding and you know this uh, this the singly loaded corridor you know have specially designed acoustical uh, um, ducts alongside so that the, there's no noise inside the secretariat complex and there are cross sections also given this is the ramp you will be surprised that these ramps are built before the building was built because in those times there were no lifts and the entire material was carried to the upper floors during construction by donkeys which were moving through this ramp because this ramp was built before the building was built. And later on it was it became part of the building. It, it was designed in such a manner. 
you can see the cafeteria was kept on the top because uh, there is a terrace garden also on the top and uh, you know kabuzi wrote that i want the the kitchen should be at the top so that fumes will not spoil the building fumes will not uh, um, create a smelly situation inside the building so the the big kitchen and a big restaurant is uh, kept on the top of the uh, building this particular block is uh, jutting out because he designed it that this is the chief minister's office having a little separate identity in the elevation than than any other uh, uh, than the rest of the facade this is the ramp i was talking about these ramps are used to uh, take donkeys up and down uh, carrying bricks and cement bags and uh, sand bags and uh, concrete and everything and uh, then uh, there was a proposal of making a governor's palace governor's palace uh, you know uh, uh, was proposed there but uh, when nehru came to see the model you can see architect piri jonray with specs and uh, the first lady architect of india uh, madam yuli chaudhry and pandit nehru is looking at the model you know in this pro uh, nehru said that in in indian democracy we have uh, we do not give that much importance to the governor governor's office is uh, is, uh, is of a different nature he said i don't want the governor's uh, um, palace should be built in the middle of the capital complex so ultimately on his advice it was shifted to some other location and this building never came up but kabuzi was crying that this if this building is not built there the entire geometry entire aesthetics of his uh, uh, complex will be spoiled so nehru said that okay you come up with some different building there so he came up with the idea of making a museum of knowledge on the same site and he designed a different building this one at the same location but unfortunately till today it is also not built then uh, you know the madam jane drew a british architect she was part of the team of kabuzie she she was uh, uh, suggesting to the kabuzie that sir we want to have some uh, special monuments to be designed in the capital complex to 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 render the blank spaces in the in the uh, plaza so he agreed and this uh, uh, some structures were designed one of them is martyrs memorial tower of shadows monument of solar house open hand and trench of consideration so, so these are some of the monuments which are uh, designed in the plaza to make it more interesting and this is the martyrs memorial having a sacred hindu symbol swastika engraved on it and uh, this is the tower of shadows this is this structure is a demonstrative project to to showcase carbozier's understanding of the indian climate you know where to put what kind of louvers to put so this structure is demonstrating that and uh, this is another view of the tower of shadows in the capital complex an open hand monument is uh, one of the most uh, prominent monument in the capital complex it is about 80 feet high and it revolves like a weather cock you know to give the wind direction it shows that how much importance kabuzie has given to the indian climate to design his buildings in uh, in uh, chandigarh and uh, this is a trench of consideration at the bottom of the uh, open hand monument it is designed to have open air discussions uh, seminars you know some meetings some get togethers so he said that uh, i want all this thing should happen at the bottom of the open hand monument and this is a complete picture you can see the trench of consideration which is a sort of a open air theater uh, at the bottom and then then open hand monument is rising in the middle and this revolves like a uh, weather cock with the wind direction and this is a picture of kabuzie you know uh, with the open hand monument another views of the open hand with trench of consideration and uh, very few people know that uh, chandigarh's capital complex has been given unesco status in, in just um, three four years back and now it is being restored to its original glory and uh, 
I was talking about commercial center in sector 17, which is the heart of the city. You know, it is located in the center of the city, having 250 acres of site, a huge plaza. You know, it consists of uh, shop come offices. It got some important buildings and like uh, Reserve Bank of India and uh, some other banks and uh, some central government offices, some state government offices, uh, bus stand. You know, all these uh, buildings are located here. It's a huge palaza. Probably in a, there are very few cities around the globe which have a, such uh, big commercial centers in the middle of, uh, you know, one was uh, Connaught Place to my mind in Delhi, which is a dedicated commercial district in the middle of Delhi. And another one is uh, this uh, Sector 17 commercial district in the middle of Chandigarh which is entirely planned to cater to the needs of the city. And this is uh, the uh, you know, pla uh, central plaza in the commercial district. It is rendered with some uh, uh, this uh, water bodies, fountains, you know, and all these uh, things so that, you know, people come in, in large numbers in the evenings and uh, enjoy their, uh, you know, company of each other here. You see the water feature in the Sector 17 Plaza and how people are enjoying in the evenings. Some other structures, some other views of the same. Then uh, government housing in sectors uh, in uh, Chandigarh is of a special note. You know, it is, it, it is uh, inspired from, uh, from Oxford program of uh, housing. You know, it got 13 categories of uh, dwellings. Type 1 is for the chief minister and type 13 is for the lowest rung of the uh, uh, employees, which is the PNs or you call sevadars, whatever. Then, you know, uh, the, accordingly the areas were given, accordingly the guidelines were given. And this is a housing, this particular housing is uh, called category 11 JC. You will be surprised to know that Chandigarh is the only city where the housing is named after the initials of the concerned architects. When I say category 11, 11J, it means this particular house is designed by architect John Ray. And then there's another category which is called 12J. It is again um, designed by architect John Ray. You know, you see the architectural vocabulary, they used exposed brickwork, the jali, small windows, to suit to the Indian climate. Again, a house 9J uh, for the you know clerical level people uh, which are working for the government. This is the housing for uh, bureaucrats, the senior secretaries of the government, or some DGP level, IGP, IPS officers, IES officers. That this is uh, built in sector 16. It is designed by architect P. Generate. And uh, this type 6J, it's called type 6J. This is the model of the same. Again, J means it is a design by John Ray. And uh, this is another uh, block of housing catering to a different uh, section of the employees. Another housing. You know, some housing is named like uh, uh, 10D. When, when we say 10D type house, it, mean, it means it is designed by uh, Madam Jane Drew and so on. And uh, in Chandigarh, they created a lot of recreational spaces. This is uh, the, the famous museum and art gallery designed by uh, Carbuzier. And uh, this is a temporary office from where the team operated to build the city. And later on, we architects have followed with the government that uh, this uh, structure should not be demolished and we should convert this to a beautiful museum. And we prevailed upon, and uh, now it's, a, it's called Le Kabuzia Center. This is a museum of architecture in Chandigarh. And uh, this is the, the famous Sukhna Lake at Chandigarh. It's an artificial lake, which is created by damming a, uh, uh, damming a seasonal rivulet. And at the lake, Kabuzia designed this uh, lake club the building is sunken deep into the ground, about four meters below the road level, and the height of the building is kept intentionally very low. Kabuzia Road that I don't want 
that my building should dominate on the serene environment of the lake and this is the, another view of the chandigarh lake and uh, chandigarh is uh, is a place where we have 35% dedicated green spaces and nearly 1700 small or big parks and this is one of the famous rose garden one of the largest uh, in in asia and uh, it is it is a favorite favorite tourist spot in chandigarh and with this i close on uh, uh, chandigarh part now i will be touching islamabad we all know when uh, you know india got partition and uh, and uh, pakistan was left with no capital city because delhi remained in india and uh, karachi served as a temporary capital for pakistan for the initial 10 years and very few few people know that uh, when punjab got divided pakistan got 62% of the share and indian punjab is only 38% and uh, ayub khan acquired power in pakistan in the year 1958 and he shifted the capital of pakistan to rawalpindi and he created a capital development authority in the year 1960 and the vision for islamabad was given by ayub khan and which is totally different from pandit nehru's vision because uh, the ayub khan wrote that i want that my city should re reflect the rich heritage which we inherited you know he was uh, time and again stressing that i want my city should be you know re um, uh, representing our rich heritage whereas kabuzi was just saying the opposite kabuzi uh, you know sorry this nehru pandit nehru said that i want a city which should be not restrained by the traditions of the past i want a modern city you look at the vision of both the leaders and uh, for islamabad you know unlike chandigarh different works were done by different architects and uh, they all these architects are very famous architects of their times doxedis and associates is a very very famous greek firm in those times and geo ponti we have many of my architect friends would have read about it he designed the secretariat complex and dennis brickton has designed officers hostel and president's complex was designed by edward stone and we have a very famous uh, mosque in uh, in islamabad which is designed by vedat daloke this is the master plan of uh, islamabad city you can see like sukhna lake we have a you know a rawal lake there you know like chandigarh the the city is conceived on the foothill of the hills also hills are also there it is at the foothills you know chandigarh followed a grid iron street pattern in islamabad also we have a grid iron pattern and in, uh, in chandigarh each sector is approached by uh, four roads in in islamabad it is the same capital complex is kept at the foothill of the hills it is the same in chandigarh uh, chandigarh so likewise there are many similarities with the uh, with the chandigarh planning i have already touched this and uh, you know this is a twin city Uh, you know on the on the upper part is uh, islamabad at the lower is the rawalpindi so the both the cities are integrated very nicely and the road network the existing network was also slightly altered to to suit the revised circumstances we test almost this and uh, this is the detailed plan you can see of the islamabad you can see the big rawal lake it is near the capital complex and there's a city park in the middle and the and the you know sector uh, sectors have a, a great planning and uh, major difference is that islamabad sector is four times larger than chandigarh sector islamabad sector is 2000 meters by 2000 meters whereas chandigarh sector is 800 meters by 1200 meters islamabad sector got 1000 acres of land and chandigarh sector occupies only 250 acres of land 
and this is the plan of the Islamabad sector. Primarily, the planning is uh, identical, but uh, the sector size is very big. This is the Secretariat complex designed by legendary architect Gio Ponti. Uh, it is, uh, you know, located at the Fort Hills. Intentionally, the Mughal landscape was followed because it was uh, located in Islamabad and uh, the city's name was also derived from the religion Islam. And uh, the buildings are uh, four to six storied L-shaped block and interconnected with each other, uh, you know, at different levels. You see the main facade you know, it has a very stylistic decoration to suit, uh, uh, to, to shield the windows from rain and sun. This is the Secretariat of uh, Pakistan Capital Complex when it was under construction. And uh, now I will just briefly, this is the Supreme Court of uh, Islamabad designed by Kenzo Tenge of Japan. And uh, you would have seen this building often on the television. And uh, it has a marble cladding on the external, and it's a combination of uh, Islamic architecture and European architecture. Another view of the Supreme Court of uh, Islamabad and the Presidential Palace of uh, uh, Pakistan, Islamabad is designed by Edward Stone. Very few people know that Edward Stone is a is an architect. Uh, who designed the American embassy in New Delhi too. You know, he got such huge assignments in those times. The currently where American embassy is, that huge building is also designed by stone. And uh, this is the presidential palace. And uh, it, uh, you know, the, the building is having uh, banquet halls at the top. Then, uh, then, we, then they have given uh, guest rooms for the state guests. This photo is taken by me from uh, one of the building of an art gallery nearby. Uh, you see, uh, this building is very simple, but it's a very huge complex, accommodating the like the entire Rashtrapati Bhavan kind of a situation. And this, uh, this is the government officer's hostel in, in Islamabad, designed by Dennis Brickton, a very famous architect. This building is very famous because uh, he has used traditional elements in combination with the modern vocabulary. Then uh, I was talking about Shah Faisal Mosque. This is this came up in Islamabad in the year 1917, designed by a very famous Turkish architect with Dolope. You see, this is one of the largest uh, prayer hall to my mind. It can accommodate 20,000 20, people in the interiors and about 1 lakh people in the courtyard. Very huge complex and one of the finest buildings I have ever seen. You see, at the Fort Hills of uh, Hills. Then some uh, typical buildings, the Nayar Ali Dada, uh, one of the very, very famous architect of Pakistan who got Aga Khan Award, I think one or two times. And uh, this is a building by him. Another view of the same. Some typical buildings along the main roads. And like Chandigarh, they have given 12 types of uh, housing uh, for, the, for uh, Islamabad. You know, but they have named it A to L. You know, A is the lowest category and L is the largest category for the chief minister. And uh, in Brasilia, this is Brasilia. Brasilia was having, uh, you know, two capitals, existing capitals, but both the capitals were located at one extreme corner of the uh, Brasilia, uh, sorry, Brazil. The president, this Juscelino president, he got elected in the year 1956. You know, Brasilia became a republic in 1898, and Juscelino became president of uh, Brazil 
with the promise that I will advance the country by in five years, which others could not do for 50 years. So after becoming uh, president, the first thing he did was to build this uh, new capital, which was named as Brasilia. And a competition was held, about 12 planners, the world uh, renowned planners participated in the competition. And Lucio Costa, uh, Costa was selected for, as a planner for this big project. You know, Chandigarh was um, developed in more than uh, five decades. Whereas Juscelino got, um, has patronized this uh, Brasilia city so much that it got built in just three years. Building the entire city in three years is very commendable. And uh, when the plan of this uh, great city was prepared, you know, the Costa has uh, uh, symbolized the plan with the uh, compared the plan with aeroplane, like Kabuzier has compared it with the human body. Because Costa said that in a space age, aeroplane will be the more befitting image symbolically. So it got uh, you know two wings. One wing is uh, having commercial structures. Another wing is having residential sectors. The middle, uh, the middle portion, which is a fuselage, you know, it, it accommodates the government buildings and the communication buildings and the transportation, etc. And you will be surprised that uh, in uh, Brasilia there are no red lights. The traffic planning is so beautifully done. And he has dedicated different zones for hotels, hospitals, and, and all that. And uh, the job of uh, planning, squares, master plan, the open spaces, and the volumes was given to Costa. And Oscar Namir was uh, supposed to design the individual buildings uh, in, the, in the entire city. And the team, you know, complemented each other. And uh, they, they created beautiful architecture. Oscar Namir, who died you know, just uh, six, seven years at the age of 102, uh, uh, he designed the famous uh, capital complex. This is a meeting happening between Namir, Costa, and President Juscelino, discussing the plans of the city. And this is an initial sketch by Costa in, in the 1957. You can see it is, uh, you know, uh, shaped like aeroplane. The, the detailed plan, you can see. And uh, this, uh, the, the entire city is uh, surrounded by a uh, amoeba-shaped, uh, you know, lakes. You know, a huge lake, you know, having different wings uh, running in different directions. The city is fitted into that. And this was uh, Brasilia when it was under construction. And this is the very, very famous uh, uh, capital complex building. It's a 28 storied National Congress building. You know, it's connected at different levels uh, in, in the middle. And uh, you can see two bowl shaped uh, structures nearby. Sketch given by Oscar Nimeir, the model of this project and uh, Another picture, these bowl shaped structures are like two houses. One the lower house, one is the upper house, as we have in India. You know, he said that I have chosen these bowl shaped to symbolize my structures with the background hills, because he said the background hills are bowl shaped. So I wanted my structures to be bowl shaped. This is one bowl is uh, put reverse and one bowl is put in a straight manner. And then there's a building of the National Congress under construction project. This is the Supreme Court, again designed by Oscar Namir, one of one of the very, very famous building of uh, Namir. This is a cathedral designed by Namir. Again, very, very famous building. This is the interior. He, he called it Crown of Thorns, a very huge building with a great capacity and it's a cathedral designed by Oscar Namir. Some other structures in Brasilia, National Theatre, this is a temple in Brasilia. You look at the kind of architecture they produced par excellence. 
This is Lady Fatima Church in Brasilia. This is a memorial in the in the uh, memory of the great President Jocelino, who made this city. And this bridge is connecting different parts of the city uh, across the lakes. This bridge is also named after the president. And uh, this is the museum there. This is the National Library in uh, Brasilia. I'm just showing you the glimpses of some, um, uh, some buildings, the famous buildings, so that you get to know what kind of architecture they have. And this is the international airport, which was built, first of all, in the middle of jungles to create this city. The entire, all materials, all consultants, all teams, all labor, everything used to come through this airport to, to build this great city. And when the city was completed just after three years, so this picture was taken then, and you see how beautiful this city is. This is the army headquarters there. And uh, now I am coming to the last part. It is the Canberra, which is the Australian capital. You know, the Australian uh, president was inspired from Chandigarh too much. He said that uh, I will also make a new capital for Australia. You look at the inspiration which Chandigarh has given to other parts of the world. And uh, this is a city which came into existence, taking inspiration from Chandigarh. But it, 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 it is not having that much of a strength because it, it, it got a very prolonged construction period. Many architects were changed. You know, many politicians changed in the, in, the, in the midway. So it was lacking that strong character which Chandigarh has. And this was the president, Robert Menzies. He was very much inspired from uh, Pandit Nehru's work at Chandigarh. He said, I will also do the same in my country. And uh, he built this Canberra city, you know, in uh, Australia. And this is a master plan of uh, Canberra. And you can see there's a parliament house is constructed on the top of the hill. And, uh, and the city is, uh, you know, have five parts. And, uh, you know, it is connected with various bridges to connect the various parts. And this is the only capital city which is designed uh, according to the topography, keeping in view the topography of the site. Because this city is designed by a landscape architect, a very famous landscape architect of uh, America. His name was uh, uh, Griffin something. Uh, you, you, you see the entire planning of the city is based on the topography of the land. Whereas neither in Islamabad nor in Chandigarh, they have given any consideration to that topography. They have just put a great iron pattern and just made it. So city was conceived by a Chicago-based uh, landscape architect. Uh, his name was Walter Burley Griffin. And the city is, uh, you know, they have a very famous lake in, the, in Australia, which is named as Griffin Lake dedicated to the master planner. This, there was a lack of patronage and only small network of roads, you know, it, it, it was the project was implemented in piecemeal. So it lacks, uh, you know, that strong character. You know, it's a combination of uh, five towns which are joined together. You know, the towns are separated by the forests. And this is the parliament of Australia. The better image is this. This parliament is a new parliament. And uh, this is the interior of the parliament of Australia in Canberra. And uh, this is the old parliament in Canberra, which was retained. And uh, this is the, you know, again, it is on the foothills, like we have other cities. And this is the interior of the parliament. You see, uh, you can see there's a, this interior looks like a eucalyptus forest because the architect conceived this interior, taking inspiration from the famous painting of uh, Arthur Boyd. You know, this is the, this painting is uh, titled something like uh, eucalyptus uh, forest. So this painting inspired the architect to design the interior of the parliament house of Australia. And this is the aerial view. 
the topography the lakes are as it is and the buildings are not dominating on the on the on the uh, surroundings this is a one center there this is the international airport at canberra the national library at australia in canberra a modern building located in the middle of lakes and uh, this is uh, another picture of the same library again a modern building and this is a uh, same library but uh, uh, this a reclining sculpture is a very very famous sculpture sculpture designed by henry moret and this is a view taken from one apartment block you know showing the entire city and the topography and the lakes and the connection of bridges this is a national gallery of uh, art in australia in located at canberra a modern building okay my coming to the conclusion part uh, i think uh, uh, all the cities as i said they have uh, they have given no consideration to the poor uh, construction workers in chandigarh we have no space for the construction workers leading to lot of slums in the city in islamabad it is the same and it is the same elsewhere no planner no architect has given adequate space to the poor builders who have designed the uh, has got the building implemented and uh, that is one of the thing and second thing i already mentioned that except canberra all the cities are laid on grid iron pattern and with this note i close thank you so much Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening session. Now I request Pallavi Mahida, ma'am, to address the questions of the participants for interaction with Surinder, sir. Yes, it was uh, really an enlightening session, uh, Surinder, sir. And I would ask the students present, or maybe the professionals present, if they have some questions to Bagga, sir. uh one of the questions has come up from one student athira nayar uh there are uh, talks about proposed redevelopment of the sector 17 uh, in chandigarh sir and in this digital age of online marketing and online entertainment how do you envisage this uh, uh, huge space which has come up and what are there have been many projects which have been floated for proposed redevelopment so what are your views on that sir okay she is very right uh, she is very right because uh, you know um, with the coming up of many malls uh, on the outer skirts of the city the young generation has uh, shifted their loyalties towards the shopping malls and the sector 17 which is the main commercial hub you know remains uh, you know the the traffic in the sector 17 is considerably reduced after that then the government decided to uh, to revamp the entire planning and now the government is doing some major changes some new building you know the some new infrastructure is being added to to revive the sector 17's original glory yes sir Uh, sir, uh, one of the students, Kajal Rai, also wants to ask that in such sector planning, there is a anonymity which is very prevalent. Like we have an experience of Gandhi Nagar also in Madhya in Gujarat. Uh, so, how do you uh, actually uh, explain that feeling of anonymity in the such planned cities? i think uh, i think we indians are used to very haphazard growth always anything which is orderly is not liked yeah. <laughs> uh, sir there, there is one more question coming from uh, sheetal sharma i'll just go to the question wait yes uh, sheetal can you yourself unmute and ask the question hello Hello. Yes, ma'am. Can you ask the question yourself, Sheetal? Uh, I just wanted to ask what is the difference in the design approach when the Carbozier used to design and the present architects when they design the same thing. Difference in I the design approach. I think. I think. Uh, to my mind, 
the kind of patronage uh, which was enjoyed by architects in the Carbuzian era was unparalleled. You know, in a, when I was uh, writing my book on uh, Carbuzier, I studied all the you know files pertaining to Chandigarh, thousands of files and fifty years of newspapers I studied, and you see. Uh, one once Kabuzier's pen was transferred by his secretary, and Kabuzier sent one telegram to the Prime Minister Nehru. And next morning, the secretary was changed, and the pen was restored back. You, you see, if if uh, architects were given so much powers to do the work, you know, I think they can do wonders. But but in in today's era, it is missing totally. There's a lot of interference from bureaucrats. Lot of interference from clients. That uh, you know, client comes to me that I want a circular house and I have to design a circular house because this is his fancy. Hmm. Though it may not be logical. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, one question from my side. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you very clearly while well discussing Islamabad and then Canberra, you were talking very clearly about your Canberra capital was very designed. Considering the topography and ecology, which was total miss out uh, in Islamabad, they had just uh, applied grid iron pattern. So I would like to uh, you to speak a bit about how, how it affects, like because they were missing out ecological planning, so they might have faced certain challenges which Canberra was able to achieve with that comparative analysis. Can you just brief certain things on those parameters? You see, uh, when we study architecture and especially landscape architecture, you know the focus remains on, uh, you know, respecting the natural topography. Yes. So some, somehow, when uh, Kabuzier planned Chandigarh, he respected the natural topography. Yes, but uh, not to the extent it was it, it was desired. So that is the main point. And same thing, Islamabad did, but when Canberra did, they respected the topography. So yes. they were much more benefits uh, which were achieved in Canberra, which were missed out in Islamabad and Chandigarh, the ecological part of the planning. I think nature was better protected there in Canberra, I okay. would say. Yeah. Uh, Pallavi ma'am, uh, may I contribute a small uh, experience of mine? Yes, 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 it was a very different narration from a common man. He's a market research person, not an architect. <laughs> and then from hearing from you, it's an excellent treasure uh, to hear you. Sir. <laughs> Rather, I okay, could connect Robert. with the language of yours with the tone that, that uh, is there. I, I think. Thank you so much. That's all. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, Abraham, sir. Can we hear from you, sir? I uh, am highly impressed by the kind of research work Baga sir always does. And uh, it's really enlightening, especially to the students who are here. So uh, one very important point which came to my mind was, I have worked in Shimla for a good uh, period of time, and I've known Chandigarh as well. Both these important cities were connected by a wonderful stretch and avenue of trees all across. And recently from Dharamkot to Shimla, the entire road stretch was widened and all those uh, cedar trees, the maple trees and oak trees, they all were cut down just to make multiple lane road. And the beauty and the charm and avenue of that entire stretch has lost. So as uh, Bhagasar rightly pointed, there is a lot of interference from the bureaucrats and other people who are actually not planners, who don't have actual subject experience. That is what is need of the hour. In 50 years back, Practitioners were respected and regarded so well. And past 50 years, we are at a situation when somebody reaches to us already with a design and tells that this is what I want. So many of the practitioners mere act as uh, draftsmen rather than the designers part. So such sensitive parts should be taken care of. Okay, one, uh, one comment here. 
Uh, Prime sir, how come you start working in my area when I don't go to your area? <laughs> that is. एक तो काम एक काम मिलता है आप फिर ऊपर से आके हमारे एरिया में काम कर रहे हैं. That is, that is just like Shailesh sir from Kerala came to Gujarat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, right now, sir, uh, we can end the question answer session, and right. we can go ahead. Yeah, we can go ahead with our panel discussion. And uh, uh, I request uh, Prerna, please take over, Prerna. Yes. Uh, thank you, Maida, ma'am. Now I request Professor Jyoti Gill, Secretary, IIA Baroda Center. Gujarat chapter and principal APID Vallabh Vidyanagar to start with the panel discussion on the topic of minimum standards of architecture education 2020 its impact on architectural practice the participants for panel discussion are architect Vatsal Joshi practicing architect from Ahmedabad and secretary IIA center Ahmedabad of Gujarat chapter professor Ritu Deshmukh from Bharatiya Vidyapeet who has also been principal at VNIT Nagpur उदयपुरशन Uh, sir i would request bagga sir also to be there for the discussion sir if it is comfortable for you no yes, i am here sir. only i am here only yeah okay. yeah sir we would like you also to join the session because that will no, give an additional no, angle to what continue, we are discussing you continue you have so many stalwarts but i will be here no problem yeah, yeah. so the whole idea of having this panel discussion this world architecture day was because the changing scenario of professional and academic demand has really uh, enforced uh, certain things onto the professional academic practice so council came up with the idea of uh, like they were already in process of amending the things and now ultimately the new gazette year of uh, minimum standards of architectural education 2020 is there here they have really done quite a good number of amendments which will be having a strong impact on professional practice as well as academy also so on this platform i would like to have a certain feedback on from all of you whether it is professional or academia background one by one i'll just raise a point and i would like to, you all to have your opinion on it the first and the biggest change is what they have done is the three year exit plan in academia which was not there earlier they have introduced now so uh, ritu ma'am this is one question because very much pure academia i'll right, like you to reflect on to that all right um Thank you so much for inviting me here, uh, Jyoti Ma'am, and all. Uh, and it was a pleasure to listen to Baga Sir and uh, get a clear perspective about so many cities in just in uh, one or two hours. So it was like a world tour. <laughs> so it was very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, coming to your point, uh, I would like to mention that um, we have uh, done an amendment which is very much required, and uh, it is like uh, since I have been traveling globally and have been connected with a lot of collaborations abroad, I know that in all the countries abroad that is the norm. So you have a three-year program uh, which is uh, sort of you know building up your foundation. and then there there is a possibility of exiting at that time and later on if you feel like coming back and completing your uh, degree or whatever then you can rejoin so that kind of flexibility is a uh, quite quite a you know something which is required and which is currently looking aligning with the national education policy is coming at a right time so all this is aligning to give an impetus to even the architectural education because everybody felt that 5 years of education and then 2 years of master so it became 7 years of architectural education and after that you went into practice so that was uh, the kind of scenario which we had till now so now what is happening even with this 3 plus model the 3 more 3 year model the issue which many students are raising is will they be getting a degree after 3 years so it is a no 
it will not be a degree of architecture degree of architecture will only be procured after 5 years so you will get some certification which they are still deliberating on what kind of certification can be given uh, whether it will be in building uh, sciences or something so that is still being worked on and it is left up to individual universities to come up with some kind of a uh, module as to what you want to coin this particular 3 uh, year course but worldwide it is a given norm that for a professional degree like architecture it has to be five year of education so that five year of education you are not going to curtail you are just giving an exit option to students that after three year you can have this exit option ma'am but here one question arises is that professionally when we are talking about uh, there are there are issues that five year wala part is also questionable as far as uh, practice is concerned so what will happen to these three year students see uh, three year will give them only some certification it is not going to give them degree to practice they will have to complete five years and then only they'll be registered as architects mm -hmm. <coughs> so that is something which i am understanding out of this there is another thing which the sept model is working on that is integrating the ug and pg so that is a better model actually so you have one year redu reduced and you can have in six years a uh, ug and pg in your hand and then you can go out and that is uh, sort of an equivalent degree which you can benefit from i'll expect anand sir and vatsal sir to reflect on to this further anand bhai anand sir unmute yourself please yeah yeah good evening everybody good evening sir uh so five years and three years as juti said even five years doesn't seem to be enough because uh, passing out students need to be or should be industry ready Uh, and unfortunately which is not the case uh, in fact i would rather give more stress on students exiting after 3 years and then start you know working with some practicing architects and that would help them more rather than spending two more years at the school unless they get into some research or something like that uh, i think the practice of architecture Uh, is better learned in the professional practices rather than the college another thing which i would like to you know uh, mention here is that uh, the academic syllabus should be upgraded uh, periodically and regularly because uh, you know at least for before some time i have lost touch with the academics uh since last one or two years but uh, whenever i had been uh, you know associating myself with some institutions i could find that even the wb mackey uh, you know books are still uh, prevailing in the uh, current syllabus as well which has lost its relevance completely in countries like india so why not teach something which is happening on the ground so this uh, upgradation of the updation of the syllabus is very very important and third point which i would like to make is uh, that the faculty unfortunately uh, wherever i have gone in juries or uh, any other uh, for lectures or whatever i have found that the faculty members are really uh, not up to the mark most of the institutions which is a point to worry about because i don't know in students i i have seen that recently even in jyotis college i had gone and the students passing out last year are joining as uh, teachers uh, without any uh, you know exposure in in practice or any other research or anything which is which is very very dangerous i think and we should Uh, in, in the people in the academics, also in practice, should uh, focus more on these problems, which lead to and it will definitely impact as as mentioned the practice of architecture. Over to you. Thank Please you, Anshay, and uh, thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Shailesh, for having me here. Uh, it's a very uh, 
tricky situation as i understand uh, first of all 3 years exit policy can be a boon in a way that uh, maybe people who are not really going to practice architecture uh, can benefit out of that i mean somebody who wants to be an architectural critic or somebody who uh, is looking at academics as a profession can kind of exit at the third year and maybe uh, for the academics there there should be a separate course uh, to uh, like a teachers training which kind of train them to teach the students uh, but for the professionals that are going to come out uh, as anand bhai said I, i agree with him that they should be working at uh, some offices maybe a year or two and then continue the rest of the course so that that really would uh, make them uh, hardcore professionals rather than just kind of passing out from the colleges and of course uh, the, the level of education that uh, we are imparting has to uh, kind of change our uh, we need to change our perspective on that too so from professional uh, point of view uh, if anybody approaches my office uh, as a pass out or there is a trainee my understanding of his work or his or hers work is going to be on how much are they aligned or how much are they moldable to getting into the professional uh, aspects easily rather than uh, kind of meet uh, spoon feeding them about every aspect of the profession so if that happens at the college level it's uh, a boon for the fraternity as general thank you abraham sir and surendra sir i also like you to also opine on the same issue surendra sir can take up first i'll continue surendra sir Ma'am. okay hello yes sir uh my college which is chandigarh college of architecture came into existence uh, i think uh, more than uh, um, 60 years back and uh, we already have this system of 3 uh, years and uh, uh, you know uh, anybody who wants to exit the college he can uh, take a bachelor degree and go away the system was there from the very beginning but to to your surprise in the in in the 60 years of period only two students have opted for this only two students so i have my doubts about this planning because you know the system which is already in place in a college from the 60 years why why the people have not opted to go out and in today's date sir 60% of diploma students are opting for bachelor degree which is 5 years full time degree after completing their diploma because they want a higher qualification you know once you get into the college uh, you know no parent you know the kind of a society we have now the with less number of children parents are very protective and they are comparatively well off uh, no 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 parent no student would like to go out i think in most of the cases this is my take on this abram sir yes uh, on this i have a uh, point that is three years exit period will not happen provided the student gets engrossed in the subject the syllabus and the entire curriculum and he will never opt to get away from that i came from a background wherein completely the subject was unknown to me and during our journey like as bagal sir and me uh, met each other during one councils meet when we have adverse situations we try to wave and swim across it against it and things have become so uh, supportive in today's era like uh, one of my before i joined for the session i took a feedback from few students that what are your points on this particular subject i would like to present them on your behalf so many of them pointed that 
students they opt for thesis by copying from libraries of other colleges so i may have a friend in spa i may have a friend in sept i may have a friend in other college they will interconnect and share thesis where is wherein that's the time when you have to get completely into the subject and involve yourselves even few students have added to the point that internship should be two sessions in the complete curriculum in five years session it should be segregated one three years before prior to and one post three years so that they get some practical knowledge when students will get involved in the subject completely or in such nature i doubt that they will ever opt for three years exit which even if the criteria set in today's date will not be taken up by anyone professor nay i would like you also to reflect on to that please there are two things which i want to tell you one is what tatu sir rightly told that why immediately past faculty uh, teacher uh, students are becoming faculties so one of the main reason is because of the industry only they are less paid in the industry they are well paid in the teaching profession second thing is three year exit is very much meaningful if we look at it in the positive side of it only serious people will be joining to move further whoever is interested to complete in a professional way so that is what i will say about this let us move the discussion further we'll debate on it again okay so, so uh, i have a point uh, in in uh, continuation with what uh, shailesh nair has said that we should try to find out why the industry is paying less to these people and why the academics is paying more uh, and if they, they don't deserve why why should they be paid more do sir in the academics you yeah, do sir but we'll go into a different debate so this you know higher yes. salaries in the academics attracts more and more students pass out to joining the academics immediately after passing out without getting exposed to the required you know nitty gritties of a practice and that is quite dangerous because without any experience how can they teach the students sir i will take you i will i will tell you another session uh, vision of it also the students who are serious who have taken a research in the complete five year course they are better academicians also even though they have no exposure of the those who want to practice attract i mean those who want to get into research and academics may continue but yeah. otherwise if if a student exists in 3 years and if he starts you know working with a practicing architect or uh, you know uh, enhancing his other software skills or things like that see what a practice of architect would look for in a new joining would be that how much he is adding value and uh, uh, to the, the the process and how more um, if he is more useful to the organization only then he will he will be retained and he will automatically uh, get paid more you know it comes right to his abilities and his uh, contribution to the process could i just add to this yeah please yes. uh there is always a discussion happening between academicians and practicing architects that why don't you make them market ready so i always have this question to the practicing architects what is market and what what do you mean by market ready because all practices are different all architects have a different way of practicing how do we make a student market ready so what academicians are basically doing is giving them skills which can may absorb them which can help them adapt to any kind of practice which is there in the market and also if we tra- if we train them well during the academics then they can also create a new market for themselves so for me uh, preparing a student market ready means that i have to make uh, an effort to give them a holistic approach to education of architecture and practice of architecture is it really happening madam uh, is it for really me, happening uh, for myself i can say that yes we are attempting and it is being done and lots of good colleges are there which are attempting to do this so even like uh, i'll just give you an example that for my students 
uh, uh, we have campus placements from Chapurji Palanji, which is one of a very big name in the field of uh, construction and builder uh, group, coming to our college and taking uh, on campus our students. That means that somewhere we are doing some right things. And somewhere we are. Madam, uh, Chapurji Palanji is a contractor. He's no, they architect. have an architecture. No, no. I what I said, it's a big builder group, and they have an architecture planning wing, where they employ architects, and they have very big projects. The government projects mostly go to them because of the group, uh, which is a big group. Second so is the Godrej. Uh, yeah, second is Godrej, which is also taking in a lot of students from our our college. They are just to interpret the. Appointed architects' drawings. They appoint these architects, and they are uh, the employees of a contractor. And they are, I will. They are, they are, I will, uh, uh, will beg to differ because motive, their motives may be very different from what uh, uh, you see. And I will. <laughs> because there are the point there which I would like to make. I would like to make, make one more point here. That. Can we not make them ask the right kind of questions or get they become adaptive in three years? Why do they need five years to do that? Because even when I passed out, that course was six years at seven. Then they reduced it to five. And I fail to understand why architects cannot be industry ready in four years. A civil engineer or a mechanical engineer can get a bachelor's degrees in uh, degree in four years. Why architecture would need uh, five years? That also is a big question. Because so, worldwide, sir. they have uh, worldwide, you can go through the net, you can find out. Worldwide, it is accepted that any professional degree needs five years to be made Madam, into a professional. In India, all the engineering courses are four years. Engineering is a technocratic degree. It's not a professional degree. There is it a is difference. A there are only CA lawyers and architects who are given the professional degree, the license to practice. Yes. yes. Okay. Here I have another question following this debate only. Okay, when we are giving for three years exit plan and we are seeing that we are agreeing somewhere and somewhere we are disagreeing. It gives one more rise to question. Okay, when right now our architectural practice, if we go worldwide, is not acknowledged. Our uh, degree is not acknowledged worldwide. Then this three-year exit program will lead our students where? Is the biggest another upcoming question because if architects from abroad are able to come and practice in India. If our students want to go and practice abroad, they have to really go through rigorous so many steps to uh, be practicing architects over there. So three years exit program. Somewhere can be beneficial to those people who accidentally landed into architecture and then they realized that okay. This is not where I should be, so that is a nice way exit program. But for those people who are dedicatedly indicating, intending to do architecture, obviously will finish uh, five years. But what will happen to this part? Is my further question to the panelists. Can I start with that? Yeah, please, ma'am. Okay. Um, so there is this um, particular notion that uh, globally our degree is not accepted. But we are also not accepting any degree in India. You will see that whoever comes to practice in India has to take a local consultant to uh, basically put forth their ideas and um, implicate their ideas. So they are either by invitation or they are having some kind of local partner uh, with them. So we are also not accepting uh, international degree and it's becoming like a you know, uh, thing. Uh, but in Sri Lanka, in countries like Sri Lanka, the uh, architectural uh, student who does a five year of architecture course automatically gets a reba certification so they are allowed to practice abroad so that is something which we should uh, for now talk to council of architecture to get these things done at their level because these are important for our students to be accepted worldwide yes. and the degree to be accepted worldwide but it is happening because we have created this kind of a situation where we don't give or we don't take also even though we are talking about foreign architects coming to india they don't they cannot practice directly in india they have to have a local partner or an indian architect working with them but achieving that partnership so, in india is very easy but very other easy. way around yeah it's very easy because we are uh, open to this kind of situation even our governments uh, are very open to this kind of situation so you will see in lot of these government projects 
they invite by invitation uh, architects from foreign uh, or the abroad and they collaborate with them so that is happening and they are ready to pay hefty consultation fee to the foreign architects rather than to give opportunity to the indian architects who may have the same kind of caliber so i have seen this happening in many of the cases of city planning and other projects uh, in india i would like other panelists also to respond yeah. to this yeah jyoti can i come in yeah please yeah. yeah so the point is that if you are talking about foreign architects or architects from india going and practicing abroad so that that is not uh, how the education system is going to uh, kind of change the situation in that a 3 year or a 5 year will not make any difference in that uh, especially if you are talking about foreign it is about the caliber of education that you are imparting to the students is that is what is going to change the situation three year or five year is not going to make any difference in that uh, particular uh, sector that you are talking about especially when uh, you you have uh, at least i mean iia is 100 year old what have we achieved as an institution or what have we achieved as a fraternity of architects in this country is going to kind of change the situation or is going to raise the bar uh, for the architects of india whether they are going to practice here uh, or going to go out so that those are little formalities if a former foreign architect comes here and kind of appoints a local one that's a that's a formality the main work still goes to the foreign architect so that is not going to kind of really make matter in that aspect the students need to be groomed for Uh, better they, they need to have proper academic uh, oriented uh, teachers who are really uh, not uh, the fresh pass, pass out says anand sir said they need to be properly and as i mentioned if if there is a three year uh, exit option there can be a teachers training uh, course which is going to be a very separate thing to teach in itself a profession uh, we are we are not trained to teach we are architects we are we are trained to design so that aspect needs to be really worked upon at the government level where uh, the grooming of the teachers that is uh, going to happen is is so uh, well done so that the uh, caliber of the students really uh, change and that is what is going to change the situation for me can i come in yeah okay so uh adding to this point i served in kuwait from the year 97 to 2000 and i experienced one thing which was really surprising to me while i worked with 28 nationals if there are a few candidates for an interview for architects post uh, there the terms are mostly project architect like it's not only architect you are required to work on the field you are required to be a project architect so in such scenario if there is a filipino guy who is a diploma holder and there are other nationals who are profi- uh, graduates the country they know the caliber they know the kind of knowledge they have they will always go for a diploma filipino a filipino national because these guys are extremely good in detailing the kind of details of every area i mean the construction details they are too good in that and even i have served with them i did experience the difference so such exposure to sites i mean the construction sites activities to site visits and all will really make a difference as we said why we are hiring foreign nationals i have worked with some infrastructure development projects in india and there are certain certain designations mentioned very clearly as international experts only so why should we take indians for that our own nationals and as uh, ritu madam said they are highly paid i mean i have seen the kind of uh, packages planned for them so provided we train and educate our students in that caliber in that strength i don't think we we'll, we have any dearth of talent in our own nation. Uh, so here question is bouncing back to the curriculum part of it and here one of the member is writing i would like to add that owner should be to make curriculum which is keeping with changing times environment ecology economy sociology history art design technology 
with the base of architectural education all this should be holistically encompassed in 3 to 4 years and one year should be professional practices what uh, manish patil is recommending over here so uh, the way we had been discussing it is coming up ke what we say one side why, why don't we keep our students market ready where madam added ritu madam added ke what is market so ultimately we are coming to skill based uh, education system and the skill based education system because architecture is cross sectional and interdisciplinary to certain extent how to design a curriculum who will take the onus of it is come back the ball bounces back to coa okay? to what extent that role will be taken care of and who all should participate in creating that new course which is developing the skills yes ma'am uh, just to add to this uh, particular point that the new education policy if you have gone through it it mentions that uh, the skill base is going to be the whole point of making this new education policy secondly uh, the talk about global collaboration so you can collaborate at the education level with some college abroad and make a new curriculum so these kind of flexibilities will of course be good for architecture and if you are talking about making market ready this will be a welcome change the third point which can add to our thing is the uh, vision which is being envisaged that all colleges will now be having autonomous status so universities we we were always generally affiliated to universities or we were depending on universities for whenever like five year cycle three year cycle there would be a syllabus change now uh, we can look forth that uh, because we can have autonomous situations so we can formulate our syllabus as per our needs so that could be a welcome change for many of the colleges who wish to make these uh, kind of uh, deliverables to available to students so you can offer lot many electives you can offer lot many interdisciplinary uh, activities you can offer global degree wherein one year you can offer at a foreign collaborated college and the rest of it can be here so these kind of facilities and flexibilities are possible it was there earlier also but now it's being more reiterated by the national education policy so that is something which we as academicians and practitioners can look forward as a welcome change for our our at least our course okay jyoti we one more thing which i want to add is hmm. this three years exit system jo hai if we can yeah. add one more thing to this educational policy that after 2 3 years of practice or 2 3 years of working in an office if that person can come and rejoin and do the uh, rest part of the course i think this type of flexible system can always help yes that yes. is there that second is already thing, there that is, is there. already there yeah second yeah, thing is, that is in certain, place. certain we now require as anansar's concern is con anansar's concern that we should now have students and faculties with conviction towards the fraternity towards the education now if i talk about this how many of faculties or students are bothered about iia or coa working for iia or coa most of the students who pass out in fifth year also they don't know about iia or activities of iia or activities of coa so this type of conviction we should make strong so that students come and do a good practice when they go out of this college but Sailesh, uh, but, Sailesh, yeah. but if you are talking about uh, IIA or COA, it it is it is not going to come about uh, from the college itself. It is going to be from the fraternity that one needs to find that space that this is where I am going to kind of. No, find actually, my, it is the second part. Uh, they should be appraised from the college level only. They should be appraised, but but, but that that does not help. Really, that does not help you and me being in this. Uh, uh, institution for so long we have understood that it does not really work even the professionals they don't find value it is, it is only when you start finding value and you you really kind of push that uh, limit that you really want to go and uh, join hands with the rest of the fraternity uh, otherwise it is every, everybody is on their own uh, kind of uh, enclave or uh, on their own pedestal and it is the the situation of this fraternity uh, to keep binding them together is going to be a challenge every time. Sir, a suggestion could be like uh, Intac and other IGBC have started their student chapters now. 
so like that even i think, think of a student chapter in the colleges and this could uh, help in you know bonding them right from the beginning and then people who are serious can join the ia at a later stage so a lot of yes, these professional bodies is, are doing that. yeah that is the purpose of this world architecture day is being celebrated with institutes ia baroda has been doing it since last 4 years with various institutes we have done it this time fortunately or what we can say that the president and secretary are the head of two colleges so we should come up with this forum and this platform today so i think yes, these prototypes can be done with various cities and various colleges i think it will slowly start building anand sir surinder sir atlas sir shailesh uh, i would like to really know who uh, you know drafted this uh, title of this uh, discussion uh, minimum standards of architectural education i mean who will who, who will set the standards or who will form these standards the gazetteer is on the name of this only the latest 2020 gazetteer tatu sir tatu sir we can try we have to do it you all have to come together and do it coa new gazetteer is by this name only sir we have to do it coa Yes, the COA Gazette is by this name only the 2020. So, what is the take of COA on this three years exit? So, they have only proposed to guys. Ma, Ritu, ma'am, can you reflect onto this? Yes, I will just share that uh, that what is being proposed is that uh, uh, if you have gone again, I, coming back to the national education policy, that it is mentioning now there will be only uh, after 10th standard there will be a bifurcation of skills. from it will be introduced at a very early stage in the school and looking at that policy if we look at it at a bigger picture the, what the council is anticipating that we will have now people who are interested in architecture or at least the design and creative fields uh, beginning their career or education and skill building from maybe 10th onwards or before that i don't know how the education policy is going to incorporate it so that was the premise behind having this three year of uh, skill development or three year of exit point so the council has therefore formulated this uh, norm that they will be providing a three year exit to students who join uh, from uh, the in the course of architecture and in that also as i mentioned in the beginning itself three year does not guarantee them a license to practice it does not register them with council of architecture they will have to complete their 5 years of education so as uh, sir was also mentioning that there is a possibility that after 3 years they can take a break come back at another point uh, saying that we want to complete this education and then they will formally get the degree of architecture to and a uh, registration to practice and also there is a thought going on that there will be some kind of exit exam for registration so that i don't know how far it is happening but that is also a thought which is going on the uh, next thing which council is also proposing is the kind of uh, uh, accreditation to schools so it may be self accreditation system or it may be an accreditation policy which they will be formulating so that is also something being worked on so your question about quality of institutions the kind of faculty and the student quality can be resolved to some level when uh, we start re- uh, introspecting and talking about what kind of uh quality we are giving back to the society okay. ma'am can uh, does this give an opening further over here ki after 3 years the council can give two options that somebody who is really interested into research into architecture and then into academics That's and professional right. practice into architecture and then into practice is the it council, possible the council is a body which does not actually regulate education uh, per se man uh, the curriculum they are giving you some minimum standards you have to follow the minimum standards you can always go over it so it is going to be as per the now the autonomous status or the universities which we are aligned to will give you a flexibility of whether you want to incorporate more research based electives or more skill based electives so electives are going to play a major role in the way you shape up your school philosophy so that can be something which you can think about like mumbai university i am just talking from my experience offers around 25% of electives 
so in these electives like in my school we have started uh, giving electives which are not something which we have been teaching in our regular curriculum so it may be uh, community based design it may be just making a, a parametric module for a shelter or something else so it may be as per the needs of the society or the area around that we can shape our electives and we can give these kind of quality based uh, things to our students i'm just trying to imagine a situation that a student exits after 3 years he works in the field for say 3 years more and then he comes back he joins a batch of students who uh, who are you know regularly graduating and uh, going from say, third year to fourth year so this guy who has worked for 3 years he comes and joins the same batch so uh, will that not be a kind of it not be uh, you know the, the the capabilities of these students will be quite different and to evolve evaluate this kind of a difference will be very difficult for the faculty members so uh, yeah ritma please yeah. sorry ritma you finish uh, yeah just i'll just share this uh, experience because i have been taking since the past 10 years a uh, workshop with the uh, french students wherein the, the students from france who are graduating from france come to india and learn something i mean they document some areas here so i have been handling students from 20 years of age to 70 years of age so yeah. i don't and that is just a passion which they have that they want like one of them it was a director in films and he said uh, at the age of 60 i felt like doing architecture and i came and i started this course so that is the kind of uh, envisaging which people are doing in india as well that keep it a, a barrier free thing where anybody of any age can come in and learn about architecture so what you were talking about passion this will come into a profession and it will also be multidisciplinary so people from all walks of life if they are interested will come into architecture but the uh, kind of question mark is whether they will be given license to practice or not that is a question mark currently sir anand sir but your question i would like to add over here you were saying that because two different age group will be doing their fourth year and fifth year together but uh, instead of playing as a drawback it rather helps the students because they get enhanced with the experience of their colleagues who are already experienced from the market like uh, i'll just add up from my experience because i did my masters in uh, urban regional planning after 25 years of architectural practice i finished my ba and uh, all my classmates who were doing my master as along with me were of the students of my son's age and uh, mm -hmm. what exposure and benefit they got because of my practice had given a different kind of elevation to her whole batch so that yes. that will help us to bridge that gap what we are discussing quite a lot so rather this kind of mixed bag of age group is good rather i i agree i agree with you jyoti and we have a similar example Sailesh obviously knows Pragnesh. Uh, uh, he uh, in our batch, he had completed SBST and then he joined architecture. So he had three more three years experience, uh, which was added on the construction uh, field, and then he joined architecture. It really kind of makes things uh, better for the entire batch. And I agree with you, Jyoti. Yes, it is a benefit. Jyoti, uh, Jyoti, you would give a complex to the faculty. <laughs> Why, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I uh yes, I, hear, sir. I hear I agree with my case was like that my case was also like that and I am fortunate that my students had come and taught me <laughs> <laughs> yes here here uh, I go as a guest faculty for masters uh, second year students so we have two electives one is ecology conservation and second is heritage conservation so similar to what uh, ritu madam and jyoti madam stated just a few minutes back uh, we even have one student who is senior to rest of others in the batch and the other students who are just passed out and joined after the bachelors they were not exposed or they may, they were not having that kind of zeal towards that subject but down the line after few lectures the way they interacted with each other and all it really made different and today was the day when i got feedback and the way we used to five to six presentations in 2 hours but today we experience one single presentation in 2 hours 
that's the kind of change it happens it brings okay anybody else on this topic or i'll just shift to a small new topic over here uh just one more thing what i wanted to discuss like capacity building we are discussing again and again for teachers that uh, they need to be given a proper so already coa is running a teacher training program where they're trying to really enhance or do the teaching skills of architects because to know and to teach are two different ball game so already uh, council of architecture is uh, like uh, giving teacher training program but somewhere don't we think as a professionals also the way market is changing so fast and there are certain things so some similar kind of sessions should happen at professional also and uh, academy and parallel is another big issue which is coming up and being discussed quite a lot because the products in the market or the technology and everything is so fast that do we need similar kind of small certificate course through so uh, uh, like council or some other professional body like iia or any other which is helping the professionals in the market to bridge the gap between technology that when we pass it and what we are right now even though you are in practice but you feel that gap is there so anything on professional people i would like to really talk about this thing from your perspective sis and i am the i i am the bath center uh, yes. so let me have uh, worked out a college connect program wherein uh, you know we would as iia representatives we would go to the colleges and uh, we would also ensure that a more number of colleges come together because there are now in gujarat we have more than 30 colleges and even in big cities like ahmedabad and vadodara we have more than 10 colleges now so these we are trying to connect these people and go to the students not only uh, you know talk to talk to the students about coa and iia uh, because people ask questions what iia is doing for us uh, but then uh, the new students new young architects should join iia and they they can take it up and take it further but once we are doing this program uh, we are sure that we are going to get good results out of it another thing which i would like to say when you are talking about capacity building of uh, the faculty and the faculty training programs from coa i think we should also have a minimum uh, you know experience uh, guideline right. that the, the faculty should have worked at least for 5 years in the field only then he should be in, or he or she should be inducted into the faculty that that we are that we are i What's i the, would like to continue i would like to continue what on that uh, were said that uh the connection it's really alienated right now the academics and the profession is really alienated and through only through this kind of uh, professional bodies that we can establish that connect and uh, from the perspective of the educational institute like uh, yours uh, and uh, sailesh sir you should be engaging more into this dialogues where uh, professional architects uh, and uh the technologies that you're talking about the ever evolving uh, construction methodologies and the new materials that are coming about have to be a regular feature at the college which needs to be really kind of because those people who are uh, kind of as anand has said somebody a fresher and kind of starts teaching is not going to have that kind of knowledge or understanding of the technologies of the new materials of the new ways of looking at things has it has to have uh, the syllabus has to integrate that uh, as a part of that uh, curriculum where the, you invite professionals you invite uh, vendors you invite material uh, suppliers to the colleges to explain what is happening and that is going to really change the situation and uh, what we are trying to do is really do that we uh, act, act as a catalyst uh, between all the colleges where even uh, i mean so some students come up and find out uh, who is doing let's say uh, good heritage restoration and i want to go and work with him or i want to intern with him iia can be the source iia can be the platform to really uh, divert uh, and attend to these kind of situations so uh, a, a very strong bond has to be created between the institutions and the professional bodies 
Uh, just to add to this point, can I just uh, add one point to this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th there is now uh, one uh, proposal which we are putting forth that there are a lot of these uh, uh, construction-related skills which are required, which nobody teaches. Neither, like you know, what whoever the student comes in our colleges, they are not ready to nowadays learn about say. Uh, construction skills per se they are they enjoy seeing it they enjoy supervising it but they will never experience it on their own so this is a kind of skill building that we can encourage in the schools uh, wherein small modules from 15 days to one month can be uh, you know and encouraged so that the students get a first hand experience of these skills which can help them in the construction industry this is something which we are proposing and which even the council will be proposing in uh, uh, aligning with the new education policy okay ma'am so i think so professional bodies like iia and all those things can also start with this kind of yes. skill based development program so that will help quite a lot with a hands on certificate kind of course i think so few of such sessions are done by asej also what i have heard about it uh as we are nearing to the end of the time google meet will also tell us to wind up i'll just prakash pethe sir who is a very senior person from our profession he has been very patiently listening to all of us i want him to summarize before i close down prakash sir please would you have few words pethe sir, sir? is gone behind the almira <laughs> Uh, I think so. Some net problem. I think so. Some technical issue with him. He is not unmuted. Yeah, I think so. Some technical issue. Okay, so uh, nearing to the end because Google Meet will tell us goodbye. So uh, it was really a nice session. I would like really now invite uh, Prerna again to find up these things. Thank you, and thank you all the panelists. It was really wonderful you, discussing with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Same, same here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for conducting such insightful and interesting discussion. Now, I request Professor Taha Padrawal to propose vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Prerna. Uh, myself, Architect Taha Padrawal, EC member of IA Baroda Center. Finally, would like to thank uh, and we are. I take this opportunity to place our heartiest thanks to Aniket sir. and surinder sir for sharing their learning with us and surinder sir also for sharing in the panel discussion i cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to join our world architecture day celebration event and motivate us to keep moving forward uh, event like this scale cannot happen overnight the wheel start rolling weeks ago it requires planning and bird's eye for the details we have been fortunate enough to be backed by our chairman and general secretary jyoti ma'am and shailesh sir uh, a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of apid and college of architecture hvt wasar who know their jobs and are result oriented my sincere thanks to yeah. the panel members and moderator jyoti ma'am uh, abraham sir ritu ma'am uh, watsal sir anand sir for contributing their time and considered thoughts on the panel session for minimum standard of architecture education 2020 and its impact on architecture practice i also like to thank from the bottom of my heart to the students fraternity who have been turned up in such great numbers from all the colleges thank you so much for your cooperation thank you 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 thank you